The city of New York's stop and frisk policy is an epic fail when it comes to its goal of recovering illegal guns. But it's been much more successful at something else, the city's very own version of marijuana drug policy. According to the New York ACLU, of the more than 500,000 stops conducted last year, nine of every ten of them resulted in no arrests and no summons. But stop and frisk resulted in more than 5,000 arrests for marijuana possession. In fact, it was the cause of more stop and frisk arrests than any other offense. And of course, the primary targets of those arrests were the 87% of black and Latino New Yorkers who were stopped and frisked in 2012. Confronted with the rigged rules of this biased system, Nerdland friend and host of This Week in Blackness, Elon James White, got together with a few other familiar Nerdland faces and came up with a new, with a few stop and frisk rules of his own. Then, inspired by the notorious B.I.G.'s Ten Crack Commandments, he put those rules together in a hot hip hop track called The Ten Frisk Commandments. And the innocent still gets stopped the wrist all the time. I'm American, I thought I came with some sort of rights that was undeniable. Whether my skin was dark or light, so much fright, abuse of authoritative might. Such, such a sight. sight to see young folks scared to even fight for their, their rights. rights. Guess what? We need more voices who are white. Let's unite right. to put this shit to bed and say goodnight. Joining our conversation from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I know he's never had an intro like that before, is the city's police chief, Christopher Burbank, a national expert on reducing racial bias in policing, immigration policy, and using social science to ensure police equity. It's so nice to have you, chief. Thank you for having me. Um, so talk to me just on a very basic level. How do you train a police force to police without profiling? Well, a difficult challenge because we all come with inherent biases, things that we've learned through out our growing up years but the focus always needs to be on behavior never on what a person looks like but what is their behavior what can we articulate and that's the rule when you look at reasonable suspicion and probable cause standards of law that's what they're based on how does a person look is not an indicator of criminal activity, but their behavior absolutely is. Well, let me ask you a question, because we were talking just a few moments ago about uh, decriminalizing marijuana and other illicit drugs. What would happen to your police force, to, your, to, to the way that you use resources, if you were not having to make arrests for drugs? Would it, would it shrink your resources because you get resources from the federal government, or would, you, would it grow your resources, freeing you up to do other kinds of criminal investigations? Investigations. Uh, again, as I've listened to the debate that uh, has gone on before, the idea, the notion that we no longer jail or imprison people for use or possession right, frees up resources, no question about it. But we always have to look. When you look at behavior, if there's criminal behavior going on and the underlying or root cause of that may be some sort of addiction or problem with either drugs or alcohol, well, we need to treat that. And we've shown time and time again in this country that simply putting people in jail does not solve this problem. In fact, we are better when we have alternatives to incarceration. We utilize those programs. Recidivism drops off. And then we avoid some of the negative impact that comes. As an administrator, if you send people out and say, enforce certain rules and regulations and we're going to hit these hard and have a zero tolerance policy, you absolutely impact people of color negatively. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about this notion of alternatives to incarceration, because I saw you make sort of yeah. a face about it. I know that yeah. it's one of the standard things that we talk about is alternatives to incarceration, but I saw you going, eh, I'm not one sure. Of, one of the things I want to make absolutely clear mm -hmm. yep. is that there has been a misguided focus on either jails or treatment. Mm -hmm. You have such small numbers of people who are actually addicted. Mm -hmm. What about the vast majority of those people who are not addicted? That's where the focus should be. Clearly, if people are addicted, we want to help them. And oftentimes, their addiction has a lot more to do with other things than the pharmacology of drugs. But we have focused on drugs as if that's the real problem, and that's a mistake. Right, so living in, well, living in isolated circumstances. Living, living in, in isolated poverty. circumstances, unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing uh, about responsibilities, mm -hmm. not having any skills, a wide range of things that we know mm -hmm. uh, uh, how to deal with. And I love what the chief is trying to do, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to be a dismal failure for a couple of reasons. Number one, where you police is something that is decided on a level higher than his pay grade. That's true everywhere. And decisions have been made all over the country that you don't police in the white community for drugs. You don't do it. 
And so the overwhelming number of arrests for drugs are because the police emphasis is almost strictly in the black community. So, so Chief, what, Chief, what do you say? That? That's, that's what we call the old drunkard search, right? Where does the drunk look for his, um, his keys? He looks under the street light. Why? Because that's where the light is, right? Not because that's actually where he's most likely to have dropped them. And so similarly, if police are only policing in communities where they expect to find drugs, for example, black and brown inner city and poor communities, does it simply just create a circumstance where you don't even bother to look in the other places? Well, absolutely, that is a valid concern. But the thing that I take exception to is the fact that a police chief, right, that I have no authority, it is contingent upon me, right, as an administrator to do what's right, to say, no, I'm not going to do this. Right? No matter what the pressure comes from, and absolutely, if we start looking at arrest rates and we're simply rewarded for the number of people that we arrest and put into jail, for no matter what the uh, circumstances are, but especially for drug arrests, well, then we're not doing the right thing. And so, as a police administrator, I need to stand up and say, this is how we're going to police Salt Lake City. And I'm not doing my job in order to keep my job tomorrow, but I'm actually telling the mayor, those people, the city council, that this is a better way to do business. In fact, this but, is going but, to have more but, impact. But, but, if, you the, are not, if you chief. are not coming up with proportionate numbers of arrests for whites as you are for every other ethnic group, your policy has failed. Because we know whites use the same number of illegal drugs as blacks do. Mm -hmm. And so are you telling me that in Salt Lake City, 90% of your drug arrests are white? I doubt it. And so oh, there no. is a racialism implicit in your policy that until you treat everybody the same under the law, you're not going to get rid of it. Are you telling me that the number of open investigations for drug dealing networks are nine times as high in the white community because you got nine times the illegal drug use and distribution in that white community? I doubt it. And so no, what are we really talking about here? I think it's a great band-aid. Let me, let me, but I think it's a great we, band -aid. Before we jump in here, I, and, and I respect what the judge is saying, but I, I want to also say something. I cover a lot of communities across this country, and, and one of the things that strikes me is that there is a genuine, I, I don't want to say revolt, there is a genuine uprising among enlightened police chiefs and among enlightened sheriffs more and more of them stepping up and saying we have to do this thing differently yep. now the judge's insight becomes useful because it is a pressure to keep yep. going that way but i really think that that it is a very vital thing to recognize that it is police chiefs and sheriffs who are often now in the lead of yeah, questioning. And, right, and let me, yeah, let me but just I don't say, want anybody just, patting let me, themselves right, on right, the Right, right, sure. But, 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 let, me, but let, me just, let me just say this, particularly to you, Chief Burbank, in, in Salt Lake City. I, I mean, I, I, the dance that I would do to hear my police chief <laughs> in New Orleans say anything like the sentences that you have said, to even acknowledge the ways in which um, the, uh, the, the policing is, in fact, occurring uh, 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 in a racially biased way. So, I, so actually, Judge Murphy, I really appreciate this. I also appreciate, uh, uh, Chief Burbank, that, that you have an acknowledgement of what's happening here. And it's clear to me that this is, this is not an easily solved issue um, and that we will need uh, police chiefs like you as part of this process. But also, we are always going to need the moral conscience of people like Judge Murphy, the research of people like Carl Hart, and, of course, the writing of people like John Nichols. Thank you all for being here. Michael is going to stay with me. Because we're going to lighten up a little bit. It's Sunday morning. No, you we are like Michael. I, I know we like Michael. <laughs> we're going, but we are going.